Once again, it's a delight to be with you all and uh, welcome you here to, to the services. I hope that you've had a good week and I hope your, uh, your week is good and your health is good and uh, uh, your, everything in your life is going according to plan. It doesn't always seem to work out that way. I know it doesn't in my life. I don't like being in the dark. I mean that both literally and, you know, spiritually or emotionally. You know, when I get up in the middle of the night sometime to go walking through to the kitchen to, gr to grab a drink of water or something, you know, I usually find a, a, one of my grandson's toys that he left laying out or a, the edge of a table leg or something like that. And we, we try to sneak through the house at night maybe to get a drink of water and uh, sometime we pay the pay the penalty for it. I've described to you in the past, I remember one of the darkest moments in my life, and that doesn't mean that I was completely depressed. It means I was down in the bottom of Carlsbad Caverns one time, and they you go about 600 feet underground and they turn the lights out. And it's the darkest, most eeriest feeling you've ever felt. I mean, you can actually feel the darkness because you look with all of your might to see one little flicker of light and you can't see any light. It is the most eerie feeling. I hate, I don't know how those men <coughs> and, and explorers, possibly women too, that went down in that cave the very first time without modern flashlights and technology with an oil lantern or a candle that possibly went out and try to find their way out of that place. I'm not necessarily afraid of the dark. When I was a child, I used to go out in the woods and camp, camp out down on the Sabine River in East Texas. Sometimes it'd get cold or get too hot, and I'd get up and walk all the way a mile and a half back to my house through the woods in the complete darkness. I was never afraid of some, the boogeyman, as they say, coming out and getting me. I was more afraid of wild animals, you know, a wild boar or something like that, or a mountain lion that are very rare, but they are out there. Uh, but I, as I said, I'm not necessarily afraid of the dark. God came upon a scene in Genesis, the first chapter, and it tells us that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Anybody, a student of the Bible, knows that God did not create the earth without form and void. It tells us that he did not create it. Tohu, tohu and bohu is a term is used in Isaiah and here in, the, of course, in the book of Genesis. And scholars know that God didn't create the earth in a mess or in darkness. But he came up on the scene, and I wonder if God was disappointed in what he found. The condition of the earth it was in absolute inky black darkness. And he says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and he said, Let there be light. I can't imagine what that moment was like for God to look at this inky black earth and this turgid tossed oceans, a water-covered earth that had been wrecked from his original creation. In the, later on in that same chapter there, it says God called the light day and darkness he called night. You know, darkness was not always a symbol of evil, as we'll see. In the book of Psalm, it said you made the darkness and it's night. And then during the night, the creatures come out and creep around at night and the, the, uh, all the creatures that come out at night. And if you don't believe that, get up in the middle of the night and walk like I've, I've been doing, I've found out that there are a lot of creatures that come out at night and prowl around. And certain birds, another morning I got up and there was this bird squawking up there in this tree. Had no idea what it was. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it making this noise. And some of these uh, owls at night will, will hoot and some of these whippoorwills and and you'll see coyotes and things that come up and light. We have a pear tree in our backyard. It has literally hundreds of pears, and they fall off and begin to rot. And, and these coyotes like to come up there and eat them. And I, I got up one morning, and there was a deer standing out there nibbling away at one of those pears, old pears there. So I'm feeding the creatures at night and didn't even know it. But God begins to make here a distinction between day and night. 
Not that there's anything bad about the night, because when you go out in the pasture at night and look up at the stars, it's absolutely glorious to contemplate God. In Exodus, the 10th chapter, I'd like to go there, he begins to use darkness uh, as one of the plagues that happened to Egypt. Let's look at that, Exodus, the 10th chapter, and beginning down in verse 21, I won't read all of that. But this is sort of the heavenly signs that took place in Egypt. After all of these plagues that had beset Egypt, God was breaking one by one the gods and the military and the economic might of the nation of Egypt to release eventually his plan of having the Israelites come out of the land of Egypt. And look at verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt, as I said. When I was down there in Carlsbad Caverns down there and they turned those lights out, it was an eerie feeling. And that was only for a few seconds. I can't imagine that for three solid days you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. But of course, Egypt worshipped a sun god, Ra or Re, however you want to pronounce it. And so God just blacks out the sun. But look at down just a little bit further. It says, Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any out from his place for three days. I mean, they didn't go to work. They didn't go farm. They didn't do anything. They stayed indoors. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. Interesting, isn't it? Over there in the land of Goshen, the sun came out. You wonder, was it some sort of a sandstorm or some sort of a fog that came in there and blocked the sunlight out? It, it, it remains to be seen what it was, but it certainly was inky blackness. As I said, God used darkness to keep man from looking directly at him as well. In Exodus, the 20th chapter, we see this experience that Moses had in verse 18, he says, And all the people saw the lightning and the thunder and the noise of the trumpet and the mo mountain smoke smoking. And when the people saw it, they moved and stood afar off. And Moses said, Speak thou with us. Or they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we'll hear it, but let not God speak with us. This is at, the, at Mount Sinai when God is giving his law to Moses, and he speaks to the children of Israel. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you in that and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. I think that God did not allow them to look directly upon him, and so it says that he was surrounded with these clouds. Every example where God was in the temple in the Old Testament he was surrounded by these clouds, these billowing clouds that hid his brilliance, as Peter, James, and John saw in the transfiguration, from the people of Israel. He was shrouded in these clouds. Every example he is shown as these clouds covering him. We'll see some examples of that maybe in 2 Samuel, the 22nd chapter, which is one of the psalms that David wrote, and I'll just quote this. He said, he bowed, his, he bowed the heavens also, and he came down, and darkness was under his feet. He made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. It's interesting. You might go back and do a study sometime about clouds. Every mention of God in the Old Testament has to do with clouds. And, of course, we know in the New Testament it says he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. But darkness really came to represent the spiritual blindness that exists in the world today. And that's really what I want to concentrate on today. You know, we use these terms like, I'm in the dark here or he's in the dark, or she's in the dark, or the light came on, you know, it finally, it, it, it sort of uh, makes the uh, explanation or gives the explanation of, of being in the dark, you know, because you are perhaps ignorant of something, you are unaware, or 
you just are uneducated about a certain thing and you don't understand the conversation and so you, we use the term that you're in darkness. As I said, it became, the Bible use it, uses this term repeatedly to, uh, in describing spiritual blindness, but also as a result of rejecting God and the refusal to hear his words and obey his commandments. And I'd like to look at some of those today. And I'd like to go there in the book of Isaiah and look at a few here. Isaiah the 20th, uh, excuse me, 8th chapter and verse 20. Isaiah the 8th chapter in verse 20. And of course this is before the chapter where it describes the Prince of Peace and it describes God's deliverance, of his ultimate deliverance. But he's warning them, and down in verse 20 he said, to the law and to this and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. He's giving them a warning here. And they shall pass through it, hardly be stead and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. In other words, when all the calamities began to happen to them, they're going to look up at God and say, why did you do this? They're going to blame him. And they shall look into the earth and behold trouble and darkness and dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Paul talked about that when they reject God and reject the power of God, that they're blinded and they're, they live in, in this darkness. Over in the next chapter in verse 2 it says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And of course this is describing here, Isaiah was called the messianic prophet. And he foresaw the coming of the Messiah and he preached and wrote about it. And of course, he's describing here the light that was to come into the world, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He says, the people that walked in darkness, they've seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. He came into the world just like he did there in the beginning when the earth was covered in darkness. And he said, let there be light. So it was when Jesus came to this earth. He shed his light upon the earth. And of course, the, uh, the explanation of who's this, who this is describing is down in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of course, no one, that can be describing no one but Jesus Christ himself. In Isaiah, the 13th chapter, over a few pages here, God promises to use darkness once again to get the world's attention. And we'll see that here. In uh, Isaiah the 13th chapter, beginning verse 6, it says, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. I was driving along this week and I was thinking about, I do a lot of driving in my job because these oil and gas wells are scattered, you know, in all directions from Oklahoma and Louisiana down to South Texas, West Texas. And I got a lot of time to think when I'm driving along, and I usually just have to turn the radio off because I can't bear to listen to most of what's on the radio. But I was sitting there, this, I was driving along this week, and I was thinking about how long will it be before these things actually come to pass that we've preached about and taught about and read about here in the Word of God that the actual second coming of Jesus Christ is really going to take place. I mean, how far away are we? Well, we thought back in the 1970s that it was just around the corner, and in the 1980s, and then we thought maybe somewhere around the year 2000, and can you believe that's been 18 years ago? We're so much closer now than when the Apostle Paul imagined that the second coming of Christ would be here. We're so much closer than we were 40 years ago when I first began to imagine when Jesus would come again. Jesus said on one occasion, you can tell the weather and the conditions of the weather by looking at the lowering clouds in the sky, you know that a storm's coming. He says, can you not tell the times of the end by looking at what's going on in the world today? And of course, that is our whole been our whole premise 
for what we do up here, what Mark does when he gets up here and gives this expose of what's happening in the world. Some people say, that's just another news report. Well, what we're doing is trying to describe and keep everyone informed of what's going on in the world so that we will know the times in which we are living. And Paul would describe that. And he, we'll look at a scripture later on in a moment. He says, The day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. There shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travails, like a woman that's in labor pains, bending over double, and because and, and they can't believe what they are seeing going on in the world. They shall be amazed one in another, and their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellation thereof shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in the going forth, and the moon shall cause her light, cause not her light to shine. So here we see darkness again, just like in the land of Egypt when God sent this darkness over the entire nation of Egypt and Pharaoh to get the attention of the people of Egypt and of Pharaoh. He said, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay the haughtiness of the lay low the haughtiness of the terrible or the tyrants. And I will make man more precious than fine gold, even of a man than the gold golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore will I shake the heavens and the earth, shall and the earth shall move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger here. And again I said he he is going to use darkness to get the world's attention. I don't know what you do when you wake up one morning and it's pitch black outside. And the next day it's pitch black. And the next day it's pitch black. I mean, farmers can't farm. I mean, the crops stop growing. The economy, I think it'll be like it was in the land of Egypt where the, the economy just comes to a grinding halt. People won't go out. I mean, that's what the, the Word of God is describing here. People who are in darkness, though, are like a person that is blind. In Isaiah 42, he describes this. I'd like to go over there and look at this verse. Isaiah 42. Let's begin in verse 5. He says, Thus says God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out and spread forth the earth, and that which comes out of it, when you, you know, when they describe God in the Bible, some of these prophets, they say, you're the God who made the heavens and the earth and the stars also, as if it were a, you know, just a, a, a preposition on the end of a sentence. You think about all the stars and the galaxies that are out there. He that gives breath unto the people upon it and the spirit of them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. And will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people for a light unto the Gentiles. And he did that through Jesus Christ or by Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out, of the, prisoners, out the prisoners from the prison, and to them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. As I said, it's, being in darkness is like a blind person, and you try to describe to a blind person what the sky looks like. It's like the, the very first time I was going to go to the ocean, and I had heard about the ocean. I had read books about the ocean. I had seen pictures of the ocean. But until you're standing there looking at the ocean, can you really take it in? Same thing with the Grand Canyon. I'd seen hundreds of pictures of the Grand Canyon, but till I stood there and looked at the vastness of that canyon, it took my breath away. I want to go back because I want to revisit that feeling I had of the grandeur of that place. You cannot describe it. You can't 
put it in a picture and give it to someone. So it is that someone who's absolutely blind and you're trying to describe the color blue to them, what the sky looks like. I think Jesus, on a number of occasions, when he opened the eyes of a blind person, the very first thing that they saw was trees and the sky. And they saw God's creation. They, were, they had to have been overwhelmed at what they saw. So it is as everyone that is spiritually blind, when they begin to see for the very first time, and we've described that in the past, how it's like the light comes on, you know, it's like you're in a pitch black room trying to live your life and all of a sudden somebody flips the spotlight on and you say, oh, this is what light is all about. So it is that everyone that is converted Uh, Down in, uh, let's see, did we finish that? I wanted to skip ahead. He says down in verse 14, A long time, I have a long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs. And I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known, and I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Talking about God reaching out and turning the light on, allowing people to see the true light of his glory and his word. You know, the Bible in the book of Ezekiel, I didn't write that scripture down, but it talks about those that make light darkness about turning everything upside down in our world so that people are blinded and they can't see and they they keep people in ignorance for for a purpose we're going to look at some scriptures here to see who is the author of that kind of darkness in Isaiah the 60th chapter we'll we'll read one more here in Isaiah Isaiah 60 and verse 1 He says, he describes the conditions on the earth and how darkness covers the earth. Arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory shall be a scene upon you. So here, a description of the condition of the earth and how it is covered in absolute darkness at this time. And I've described that before about... How, it, how difficult it is to preach the gospel message to the world that is covered like a veil under this darkness that they can't see and they're absolutely blind. Joel, Joel the second chapter, I want to go over here to Joel because he describes uh, the day of the Lord. And he also describes the serious crisis that is upon the world. And, it, and the, uh, a warning here actually of an impending invasion In the book of Joel, he lived during a time when there was a plague of locusts that flew into the land and absolutely decimated all the crops. Joel took this opportunity to describe to the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah that there was an impending invasion just like this plague of locusts that was coming upon them. Look what he says, Blow you the trumpet in Zion, chapter 2 and verse 1, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes. It is near at hand, just like we read back in Isaiah. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and strong, there has not ever been the like, neither shall there any more after it, even to the years of many generations." An absolute decimation. Look down in verse 10. And the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Here, I believe, is another description of those heavenly signs that we read about. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide in it? Describing the second coming of Jesus Christ here and what he is going to find. I want to skip ahead. I wanted to read a lot more of that book there, and maybe sometime I will. 
go back and go through this whole book one verse at a time. But look down at verse 30. And Jesus actually quotes uh, a, a similar scripture, uh, a, a similar verse here. In, in, down in verse 30, and he said, I will show wonders in the heavens and, the, uh, and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And of course, we know in Matthew, the 24th chapter, where Jesus talks about the heavenly signs. Immediately after the great tribulation, these heavenly signs are going to appear. And then, of course, the day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I read that part of it because this is not a very positive sermon. It is sort of leans towards the negative side, and I apologize for that. But I wonder those that are there in that day, when these heavenly signs take place, the book of Revelation tells us that there are going to be people in that day who are going to fall down on their knees and say, Save me, O God, and God is actually going to save them, and they're going to be one of the very first people who walk into the millennium under the reign of Jesus Christ. They're going to see this heavenly sign take place. And I wonder what will be going through their minds when they see absolute pitch black darkness when it should be noontime. Something is going to rock them to their very soul, to their very core, to cause them to realize that there is a God up there in heaven and that he is coming back and that he has stopped what we take for granted every day, the, the sun coming up every morning and absolutely blotting it out like he did in the land of Egypt. And they're going to realize that things aren't the same today as they were yesterday. I think it will be a shocking revelation to them. Uh, over in chapter 3 and verse 13, well, let's pick it up in verse 11. Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause the mighty one uh, to come down, O Lord. He's, he's inviting all of these heathen nations and saying, gather up all of your war implements. Come down to the valley of decision. We're going to make a decision right here. We're going to see who is God. He said, let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put you in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflowing, for their wickedness is great. You remember the Bible describes their, uh, the cup of their iniquity. You remember back when, when God sent the angels to destroy Sodom? And Abraham said, if there were only 50 in that city, would you not destroy them? And God said, I wouldn't destroy it for 50 righteous people. And Abraham said, perhaps 45. No, I wouldn't destroy it for 40. Well, what about 40? And he plays this negotiating game with God. I, I feel that I, I like the fact that God is willing to negotiate with him. And he goes down to 30 and then 25 and then 20 and then 15 and then 10. In the back of Abraham's mind is his family that's in Sodom. Lot and his wife and all of their children and their wives. And he, I think, is negotiating to God for, be, for on behalf of his family. And God even says, if there were ten righteous, I won't destroy the city. But it's apparent that when God gets there, there's not enough righteous people there to save the city. So he goes about and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, he describes that as their cup of their iniquity is full. That there's a point where God has no choice but to destroy them because of the wickedness that is in the land. It is filled up. He said, and he describes that, that their vat is overflowing for the wickedness is great. Multitude, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, 
but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Now, there's the positive side of that, that we do have a great hope in God, that we know that this great tribulation is coming. We know this time of darkness is coming, but we have to keep our eyes focused on the millennial reign of Christ and, and being there with him. Down in verse 17, So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion in my holy mountain. And it will be absolute that we know that. In Amos, the fifth chapter, I don't often turn over here to the book of Amos. Amos 5, uh, here is another call to repentance down in verse 13. He says, uh, therefore the prudent shall keep silent in that time. It is a time for it is an evil time. Seek good. Now he's calling for us to Continue in righteousness, even though the world is falling apart around us. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord God of hosts shall be with you as you have spoken, like he was with Noah and, and other patriarchs. Hate the evil and love the good. Establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Talking about protection here I believe look down in verse 18 woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord and I've heard people on television preachers get up and say oh if I could only be there in Jerusalem you know when Jesus comes here it says woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord to what end is it to you the day of the Lord is darkness and not light look at verse 20 Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? That's going to be a very perilous time there for the world. It is only until the establishment of the kingdom of God will it be, be light and be bright. Uh, over in chapter 8, it describes in verse 5... Uh, his imminent judgment, of course, upon religious people that, that abuse the Sabbath day and abuse God's holy days and go through all of this religious rigmarole, as, they, as you, you might term. And down in verse 9, it says, It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in, in a clear day when it should be a bright, sunshiny day. And I will turn your feast in the morning and your song in a lamentation. I will bring up sack sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son, the end thereof as a bitter day, like losing your very own son. Behold, the day comes, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not the famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. To me, this is a warning here. For those who would neglect the word of God, they would just sort of let it slip away over time, over weeks, months, years. And they neglect it to the point to where God just takes the, his word out, where it can't be heard anymore. Not that there isn't preaching that's going on right now. He's telling us, he's warning us, not to neglect this, I believe. Look what he says. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. It's like they abused that privilege so long that it came to the point where it wasn't available anymore. I think that's a warning to, to all of us, I believe. In Zephaniah, uh, the first chapter, over just a few more pages here, uh, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and then Zephaniah. Zephaniah 1 and verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and it hastes greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation or wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, just like we read there in the book of, uh, of Joel. 
God is here describing in Zephaniah how he's going to cut off the pagan gods and their pagan priests and their pagan practice, practices. And what he's essentially saying here is nothing is going to save them. Look down in verse 18. He said, um, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by, fire, by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance or an end of all them that dwell in the land. Here, of course, talking about the destruction that comes. I want to go to the New Testament now. Jesus described darkness, and he used it as a symbol of the end result of the wicked. We'll look at a couple of these real quickly here. Matthew, the 8th chapter. In verse 10, I'm going to just get right to the heart of what he's saying here. Um, this is where the centurion servant was healed. And, uh, of course, he, Jesus gives the command to this centurion, go your way, and, and, and his servant was healed. He says, uh, unto those that followed him, Verily I say unto you, down in verse 10, I have not found faith no so great, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that... Many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These were, this was directed at those Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' day when they should have been accepting his words and yet they turned and rejected his words. And here he's sort of describing what I mentioned earlier. There's going to be those who've never heard the gospel message, who never heard anything about the Feast of Tabernacles, who never kept a Sabbath day in their entire life, who ne never understood about God's law, never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Right in the very end are going to see all of these signs of trouble and this day of darkness and they're going to drop down on their knees and repent. And God, they're going to walk and be the very first ones right into God's kingdom. In Matthew 22, he gives a warning here for those who take lightly that calling that he's given us. Look what he says down in verse uh, 11. Matthew 22, verse 11. And this is the parable of the marriage feast and when the king came, of course, you know, he had sent out all these invitations. Some of the people had all their different excuses. But look what he says. And when the king came in the, uh, to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Here's a, here's a wedding. He's putting on this great wedding, maybe for his daughter. And he walks in and there's a scoundrel sitting back there in some hobo clothes. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? Maybe he was supposed to be in the wedding itself. And he said, and the man was speechless. He didn't have an answer. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Here we see this idea that Jesus is using of darkness being a place of oblivion, I believe, for those that would reject or take lightly the invitation that we have. And of course, we know in the book of Malachi, it says the wicked are going to be ashes under the feet of the righteous. We also know in the book of, uh, in, uh, the book of Jude and of course in, in Peter's writings that that's going to be the ultimate fate of Satan and his demonic world that they're going to be cast into outer darkness and that is their reward for their wicked life and uh, I won't read the other one the other one I had was the parable of the talents where the one guy brought one talent said here's the talent you gave me and God says take this unprofitable servant and cast him into outer darkness some dire warnings there in Matthew, the 24th chapter, while we're here, we'll go ahead and read this. Jesus describes the heavenly signs and his use of darkness. Look what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Here we just read, uh, or you can go back and read the entire book of Matthew 24 where it talks the sign of the, his coming he describes to his disciples here of wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilence and earthquakes and all of these catastrophes as, as is portrayed in the book of Revelation. 
And immediately after those are the heavenly signs, which are going to stop all human activity. The whole world is going to come to a screeching halt. And then, look at verse 30, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. In uh, the 27th chapter, I wanted to read another one here in Matthew while we're here. And this is the darkness that surrounded the crucifixion. Of course, Jesus was, he was betrayed, he was beaten and whipped, and they carried him out and they hung him on this Roman stake. And down in verse 45 of chapter 27, it says, Now the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So three solid hours of pitch black darkness when it should have been a bright, sunshiny day. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of them that stood there when they heard it, they said, this, is, this man is calling out to Elijah. And straightway, they, one, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And, he, and the rest said, let it let be. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus, when he had cried out with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, or he eventually died. That Roman soldier had thrust his spear into his side, and out came the water and the blood, and he, he died. He expired. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent in two, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. There were certain people there that were resurrected because of this event. And they came out of their graves after his resurrection and went in the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done. They feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. I think that darkness shook those people as well. I believe it was an event that was planned by God that darkness would overtake this moment here and penetrate the minds and the hearts of those that were there. Jesus said on one occasion... When they were asking him about his betrayal and his eventual time to, be, to go and be crucified, he said, this is the hour and power of darkness. When Satan would have his way and try to thwart God's plan of salvation. In John, the first chapter, it tells us, I'd like to read that, John 1 and verse 5. John 1 in verse 5, talking about this, the description here of Jesus Christ. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But look down in verse 5. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. It talks about how those that were uh, of Jesus' own lineage actually rejected him. And he, he was there telling them who he was, and they absolutely rejected him. In the book of Romans, Paul describes all the acts of darkness. And you can go back and read that all in Romans, the 13th chapter, where he talks about how a Christian life can be overcome with darkness and the dark, dark and evil deeds that are in the world. And uh, how God is eventually going to reveal what is in the darkness. So let's look at 1 Corinthians, the 4th chapter. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, he says, Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. I read that because people think that because they do things in the dark, isn't it interesting that they betrayed Jesus at night? They came to him at night. He said, why do you come to me at night? I, I'm often preaching in the temple, but they came at night as if to hide from the rest of the world what they were going to do. You know, it's often been said that bar rooms are not bright, brightly lit. You know, Jesus said that 
uh, people reject the light. They hate light. They love darkness because their deeds are evil. He makes that distinction. I want to go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. I have to read this because this describes uh, the one who rules over darkness. In uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 8, Uh, I got the wrong scripture. It's in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the schemes or the plots of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. You remember in Daniel's day when he prayed and he said that he was going out and uh, his prayer, the angel that came to speak to him said he was withstood for one in 20 days by this prince of, of Persia or whatever it was, this evil spirit that was keeping him from coming and answering Daniel's prayer. I wonder if that happens today. Are there evil spirits out there that are controlling the minds of some of these dictators that are in the world? I mean, when you look at the squalor and the filth, I had a gentleman describe to me the other day about uh, what's going on uh, in some of these countries in, in South America and uh, how he had visited some of these countries and it's absolute squalor, and you can read in, in uh, your news headlines of what's happening in Venezuela right now, and what, what kind of, you know, they're trying to decide in Venezuela whether they ought to buy the meat and feed it to their children because it's rotting there on the, on the marketplace. And one guy, I read an article this week where he says, uh, I fed it to all my kids and only the little one threw up. You know, that's what kind of world that they live in and what kind of dictatorship. It makes me wonder if those countries aren't being controlled by evil, wicked spirits in high places. And, of course, he goes on to talk about wherefore take on the whole armor of God and all of those uh, great attributes there. Uh, Colossians, over just a few pages here, uh, and we'll wrap it up here in just a few verses here. Colossians 1 and verse 12 You know, Paul wrote this letter to the Colossian church. He probably never, he probably didn't found the church in Colossae, nor had he, some have suggested that he never even visited Colossae. But while he was in Rome, in prison, he wrote a letter to the Colossians because there was a bunch of heresies going on within the church. And he's trying to bolster them. And look what he says down in uh, verse 12. He says, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what happens to us when we become converted. That old life that we live and the blindness and the darkness that we once walked, God delivered us from the darkness and has translated us unto, into his kingdom, into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And uh, the final scripture, 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. And this is sort of along what I described earlier. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light. Don't ever forget that. God knows who his children are, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So why would a child of the light want to go anywhere where there's darkness or dwell in the darkness? Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunk are drunk in the night. 
But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you are already doing. Darkness is used by the Bible as a condition of spiritual blindness. It truly conveys the situation most people find themselves. It's hard to imagine that people live, they operate, they work, and play, and exist in darkness, and the bad thing is they don't even know that that's what they're doing. People live in darkness, cities and towns live in darkness, countries, and yes, even whole nations. They believe that this condition is normal because they've never actually seen the light. As I said, when you just try to describe the ocean to someone who's never seen it or the Grand Canyon or perhaps the blue sky to someone who is blind, don't let darkness overtake you. Stay in the light of God's true love and the example of Jesus Christ. And pray, brethren, for others, those that may not see the light of the Son of God yet, that they may be saved from the power of darkness. Thank you.